my own case, I really have enjoyed studying creation to love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, and with all my strength, and with all my mind. So the process of doing geology is using our minds with logic and reason to see what God did in the past to help us understand his creation of general revelation. I frequently put up a picture of Dr. Ross's book, Improbable Planet, and I'm delighted to have read it and appreciate all the different chapter titles where he establishes the foundation, he gives the air conditioning, you know, and all those kind of things that get prepared for life. So I couldn't help but include this as I speak here at RTB. Uh, there is a volcano, and I uh, appreciate Psalm 104, 32. He touches the mountains and they smoke. And... Another verse of scripture, Job 12, 8, or speak to the earth and it will teach you or let the fish of the sea inform you. So for me, as a scientist, as a geologist, this is a plain old invitation to study God's creation through the lens of geology and chemistry, which I've been privileged to study. Uh, that last uh, photograph was a volcano up in Cook Inlet, Alaska, so it was in the United States. But the one we're talking about primarily now, of course, is Hawaii. So here's an example of a, some of the eruption that blasted some ash into the atmosphere within this last couple of weeks as um, Kilauea is, uh, is uh, erupting lava. So there are the four islands, the big island to the south and successively on up the chain to Oahu where Honolulu is and on to the west. So we'll look at some of these. There's a view from a distance of Mauna Loa, and it is about 13,700 feet. So it's what we call a shield volcano. You can see it's very broad and wide, so it was built very slowly, where, of course, lots of volcanoes are rather peaked, as the one that I showed that was in Cook Inlet. Now, looking at a map of the area of um, the big island, Hawaii, Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea are the two big ones that are those shield volcanoes that are right in the middle of the island at that light tan in the central part and then to the north. The area that's been erupting is to the southeast. So Kilauea is down there where I have the star on the, uh, on the southeast corner, and that's where the eruptions are taking place and all the activity that we've been watching over the last several weeks. Um, there's a map that kind of shows the area, so you can see it in the context and the oval dashed circle, or the oval with the dashed red line, uh, sort of shows the area where the dominant eruptions and the activity has taken place, including blasting away with ash uh, to somewhat up in the air, but lots of lava flows. Day after day, we see pictures of lava flows. Lava flows coming out of fissures and fractures, uh, threatening houses, closing roads. I even ended up seeing one video, one, one shot that had this blue flame, and I thought, well, that's not lava. <laughs> okay, something else is going on, and I read the caption, and sure enough, there's some methane gas that's coming up along with these eruptions, and so that is methane gas that's burning. More lava. Lava spewing uh, through a fissure, spreading out on either side, killing all the grass that's there, trees that are there, knocking everything out of the way. Lava flowing over uh, a cliff. Even a lava falls. Not a waterfall, but a lava falls. <laughs> okay? I'm not sure I've ever seen anything quite like this, but lava's coming out fast enough that it's flowing down a, do we call it a river of its lava? <laughs> a river of lava? I'll call it a river of lava. And it's falling into the ocean. Well, how in the world were all these volcanoes and all these Hawaiian islands formed? Well, here's the geology behind it. Our understanding that there is a hot spot down in the mantle, and that hot spot stays basically stationary, and it has been spewing lava up through that conduit 
through the Earth's crust and then builds the islands as the crust slowly moves over above it. So you see the success of islands and the sense of the motion, the plate motion that's carrying the plate further to the northwest. So let's expand that idea, and there's a view of the Pacific Ocean Basin. That includes the Hawaiian Islands, and beyond the Hawaiian Islands that you may not be aware of, there's also a long continuous trend of what are called emperor seamounts. So if a volcano that we see above land ends up that the seabed subsides somewhat deeper so that it's no longer at the surface, we call that a seamount. So there's a whole series of seamounts that do not come up to the surface that formed as the oceanic crustal plate passed over that hot spot, and we'll see timing of these issues here in a few moments. So there are the islands with the big island to the southwest or southeast, and then uh, Maui and Molokai and Oahu, and finally Kauai up to the far northwest, uh, just about the edge of the picture. Now, my talk, you'll note, is related to and is integrating concepts of uh, radiometric dating. So now on top of that satellite photo, I've added some ages to the different segments of the volcanic rocks that are on these successive islands. Well, down on the south end of the big island, you can see, and we know that we're getting eruptions right now, so I have the word now, in the last couple of weeks. So in that end of the island, the age of the rocks are zero, that's today, and going on back to about 400,000 years. Then a number of radiometric ages from the rocks that came from Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea indicate that that big island is formed on the average about 400,000 years ago and over time periods and over a time span. Then you can see the next one to the northwest is 1.3 million years. The next one is 1.9 million years. The one that Honolulu is on, 2.6 million years. And then finally, um, Kauai to the northwest of this group, 5.1 million years. So. That concept, then, of the plate moving over is supported by these radiometric ages, of which I'm going to explain, as I said, as we step through this talk, uh, and explain it in terms of pictures and stories. Now, we can go beyond just the Hawaiian Islands, and this graph shows up to 5 million years, and then it extends on uh, up toward Midway Island and beyond Midway Island until there's that bend in the islands and seamounts uh, at about 43 million years, and then on up to the Aleutian Islands, um, about up to about 80 million years. Well, because we're getting ages, we can calculate a rate at which that plate is moving on average. So there's 2,200 miles from the big island to the bend, and the average motion to the northwest is about 2.3 about 3.2 inches per year. So we get a piece of information, you know, to understand the rate of a process. Looking at the Emperor Seamount segment, from there on up to the Aleutians, 1,500 miles. There, the average movement rate is about a little bit less, about 2.6 inches per year. So, got powerful data here to see about a process that's been going on in the Earth eight, for about 80 million years. Now, we are very blessed with satellite technology now that the science community can very precisely measure the rate at which these plates are moving now today. So there's a map of the world that shows arrows that represent, and the length of the arrow represents the amount that that particular segment is moving as measured by satellite capacity to measure motion in very, very precisely. So there's the segment that represents uh, the Big Island, Hilo, Hawaii, and it is moving to the northwest at about 3.1 inches per year. So here we have a modern technological measurement, 3.1 inches per year, and it fits the historical understanding from radiometric dating methods that 
these have been between 2.6 and 3.6 inches per year. So there is modern contemporary practicing geology giving us some confirmation of historical geology in the past. The Hawaiian Islands offer a fascinating natural laboratory to test young Earth and old Earth models, including the reliability of radiometric dating. Both models have clear expectations that can be compared with what we actually find in nature. The Hawaiian Islands and Emperor Seamounts formed as a result of the Earth's crust moving over a semi-stationary hotspot deep in the Earth's mantle. The hotspot heats and expands the crust, eventually melting conduits to the surface and building a volcano on the seafloor. As the crust moves, the source of lava is cut off from the older volcano, and a new one begins to form. Away from the hotspot, the crust shrinks, making the islands sink, a process called subsidence. The islands also begin to erode, and reefs grow up around the edge, building up layers to stay where sunlight still reaches. According to the old Earth model, this process has been going on for a very long time, maybe sometimes slower or faster, but spread over many millions of years. According to the flood geology, or young Earth model, these islands and seamounts all formed in just a few years, maybe in as little as a single year after the start of Noah's flood. These different models lead to very different expectations in terms of the degree of erosion from one island to the next, the degree of subsidence, reef thickness and fossils, and what should be expected when rocks from each island are radiometrically dated. We'll start with the flood geology model. Flood geologists argue that when Genesis says the floodgates of the deep opened up, that this is a reference to the crust rupturing at the start of the flood and beginning to move tens of miles per hour. In this view, the hotspot began some time after the beginning of the flood and was extremely active, bursting to the surface and forming one volcano after the other in rapid sequence. With most of the islands formed at nearly the same time, the crust should have cooled at about the same rate, so each island should have experienced about the same amount of subsidence. Each island should also have experienced about the same amount of erosion and growth of reefs around the edges. And if we look closely at the fossil reef organisms, we should find the same kinds on all the islands since they were all forming at about the same time in the ocean. Now let's consider the old Earth model. Radiometric dating of rocks from many of these islands and seamounts indicate steadily increasing ages up to about 80 million years. Islands formed over millions of years lead to very different expectations. Slow movement of the crust over millions of years should result in large differences in the degree of erosion, the amount of subsidence, reef thickness, and reef fossils. So what do we find? We'll start by looking at a series of islands along the Hawaiian island chain. At the big island of Hawaii, we see what an actively growing volcanic island looks like, followed by more and more eroded islands. Considering subsidence, the Hawaiian Islands are still mostly above the water, but as we continue up through the Emperor Seamounts, they dip below the surface. The ocean crust sits lower and lower until near the end where the tops of the former islands are under nearly a mile of water. Reef thickness also increases with age and subsidence as reefs add layers to keep within the photic zone. At Midway Island, researchers drilled through 1,000 feet of reef limestone before reaching volcanic rock. In addition to measuring thickness, Fossil reef species were identified in core samples. The species change with depth, with many of those at the bottom found nowhere on Earth alive today. In each case, the evidence fits old Earth expectations.